Hello. In today's video, I'd like to talk to you about some basic kinds of archaeological measurements and what kinds of tools archaeologists use to make those measurements. Some of them are pretty simple, straightforward things that you probably already know how to use quite well anyway, such as digital calipers. Those are pretty straightforward. We can, for example, measure the thickness of a flake with a caliper and just read the measurement off the digital display. Uh, we can also flip it around and use the other side of the caliper um, to measure the interior diameter of, of small circular items like uh, pipe bowls, smoking pipe bowl, bowls, that kind of thing. Um, but some kinds of uh, calipers are a little bit more complicated to use, and I'll show you how that's done. And uh, archaeologists also make use of a lot of charts to make measurements. So I'll demonstrate the use of some of the main kinds of charts that archaeologists use. Now, one of the things you need to know how to do how to use is a vernier caliper. Now, admittedly, nowadays most archaeologists would use a digital caliper, which is much easier to, to use. But just in case you ever have to use one of these, and I have to say they do have the advantage that they're made of plastic, which means they are much less likely to damage artifacts while you're measuring them. Uh, whereas most of the digital ones have metal jaws on them, which can actually cause damage and uh, what, you, what you might call pseudo retouch on the edges of lithics and so on. But anyway, because of that and for other reasons, partly because these are just inexpensive, um, it's useful to know how to read a digital, or, or sorry, a vernier caliper. Vernier caliper means that you have to read off these little tick marks on the side instead of just having a nice convenient digital readout. Now, when you take a measurement with calipers, let's say you're trying to measure the maximum thickness of this flake, you probably want to measure it several times to make sure you actually get the maximum, but you, you get your measurement here by you slide this with your thumb, uh, and you get it so that the jaws close on the part where you want to measure, uh, making sure that it's aligned correctly and so on. And then you gently remove the artifact from the jaws without changing them. And then you need to know how to read this. Now, uh, first thing you do is you look where the, on this lower scale here, that's the 0.05 millimeter scale, you look where the zero is. And the tick for the zero uh, doesn't quite line up with one of the ticks directly above it on the millimeter scale. Archaeologists these days are always using millimeters and centimeters for measuring artifacts. But if you look on that second scale, the one directly above, you can see that the measurement that I just took should be somewhere between, if you judge where that zero tick is, somewhere between 23 and 24 millimeters. If I'm reading that correctly. Let's see here. Yeah somewhere between 23 and 24 millimeters. And probably I would guess, since it's not quite halfway between those, it's probably somewhere between, somewhere around uh, 23.4 millimeters would be my best guess. Now, the way we can try to confirm that now is we now look at in the neighborhood of the four over here. So if we think that might be 23.4, this would be, uh, this is where we look for that. So we look at the four, and we look at the tick of the four, how it lines up with the tick directly above it. If it, if it aligns with it perfectly, then we record our measurement as 23.4 millimeters. Uh, in this case, it's not quite perfect, however. In fact, the tick to its right, which is halfway between four and five, seems to align a little bit better. In fact, it aligns pretty well perfectly. In fact, the five almost aligns with it too, but I would judge that the half, the tick halfway between four and five aligns best with the tick above it, if I'm looking at this correctly. Or actually, maybe I'm wrong. No, actually, now I think about it, it looks to me like the five tick lines up perfectly with the one above it. So that would mean that the, the correct measurement for this uh, would be 23.5 millimeters. Had it been the halfway between one that lined the best, then that would be 23.45 millimeters. So you can see that with even a cheap vernier caliper like this, we can get precision to 0 0.05 of a millimeter, which is actually pretty, you know, surprisingly good. And I have to say too that with plastic verniers, they're not all of equal quality. So even though we might be able to get a high degree of precision uh, with one of these uh, calipers, it's not necessarily highly accurate. But having said that, in some respects, the plastic one is preferable in terms of accuracy to some of the metal ones because in order to prevent damage to artifacts some people put a little bit of tape on the edge of the jaws uh, to kind of cushion the impact of the 
jaws on the artifact, but when you do that, that creates a bit of bias because you're actually adding a layer of thickness to the jaws, which is going to ca cause a systematic error in your measurement that you have to correct for. While most of the measuring tools that archaeologists use in the laboratory are pretty straightforward and, and um, don't require any major training, uh, for example, we use a lot of quite often use digital calipers. All we have to do, if you want to measure the thickness of this flake, for example, is clamp it down on there like that, gently remove it, and then read the, the thickness in millimeters right off the digital display. Um, one tool that's quite commonly used, especially in lithics analysis, um, sometimes confuses students at first, and that's called a goniometer. It's hard to see in the slide, I'm thinking, because it's trans this one happens to be transparent. Um, you might be able to see it better in a close-up view. But what this does is it measures angles. So you'll notice the goniometer opens and closes like this. And this line is the zero line. And where this line intersects the black vernier, that tells us the value of any acute angle in here. So this right about here, for example, is 45 degrees. This is 70 degrees. This is 30 degrees. So we're looking for this angle angles. In the case of lithics, we're quite interested in the edge angle, what's what we call the edge angle, which is kind of like the sharpness of the tool. So it's this angle here. We're not really interested in angles like that, at least not most of the time, but we're interested in angles that have to do with the function of the tool. You know, how, how sharp is it? Can it be used for chopping or slicing or something like that? And a more acute angle tends to be good for things like incising and slicing, whereas a, a more obtuse, slightly more obtuse angle might be for something like chopping. So that angle is very important. And the way we measure that angle is with a goniometer. Uh, we try to bring the goniometer as close to the flake as possible, uh, keeping one edge uh, along the bottom surface and the other one aligned with the top surface. We hold the ventral surface of the flake as tightly as we can against the zero arm of the goniometer and holding it so that the edge comes as close as possible to the protractor part and then move the other arm of the goniometer downwards on the dorsal side until we get a fairly tight fit across the edge. Then we can read the edge angle as 51 degrees. When we do that, one of the things you'll find is you'll have to take such, such measurements many times because you probably won't get exactly the same measurement each time. So it's a good idea to take several measurements and then average them. One of the reasons we get errors in goniometer measurements is that when we're measuring things like the edge angle on a flake, real flakes do not have perfectly triangular cross sections. Consequently, when we push a goniometer up against the edge of a more realistic flake, the angle we get partly depends on how closely we push the goniometer up against that edge. If you get a measurement that sounds very large, like 110 degrees, you've read off the wrong vernier, because the angles we're mostly interested in are pretty acute angles, and uh, that means they'll range somewhere usually between 0 and 60 degrees or something like that. So if you end up with a measurement that's much bigger than that, you should check your measurement again, because you may have made a mistake. To measure the maximum length of a flake using a circle chart like this, you just place the flake on the circle chart and you try to find what is the smallest circle within which the entire flake will fit. And in this particular case, if I move it around a little bit, you can see the biggest, the smallest circle that it completely fits within is the 8 centimeter circle. So it's a little bit too big for the 7 centimeter circle. Um, but it uh, is well within the 8 centimeter one. So one might guess uh, fairly precisely that the maximum length on this flake would be 7.5 centimeters or thereabouts. So 7.5 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. Here we have another flake. If we put that on the chart and try to get it to, I can try to get it to fit within the 5 centimeter circle and it doesn't quite do that. So again, the smallest circle within which it fits completely is the 6 centimeter circle, and, and once again it seems to go outside the boundaries of the 5 centimeter circle by about half a centimeter, or, uh, so that we can estimate the maximum length of this flake as 5.5 plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. 
Okay, what we see here is called a diameter chart, and this is a chart that we use to estimate the diam diameter of uh, rim sherds and base sherds, as well as to estimate the percentage of their circumference that is preserved. Now when you look closely at a diameter chart, it has two axes that are labeled like this. It also has some radiating lines here that are labeled, the radiating lines are in two and a half percent of the circumference of a circle. So this one, you could measure it in degrees instead, but uh, for re reasons we'll get to later on, uh, it's uh, actually useful to have it measured in percentages of a full circle. So the entire arc, if it makes 45 degrees on here, would be 25% of a circle. So here we have it divided into 2.5% increments. So from 2.5% here, 22.5% there, 25% here. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the uh, arcs here are gradually increasing in size by half a centimeter at a time, which means that that's equivalent to one centimeter of diameter. So this distance here is five centimeters, which means 10 centimeters of diameter. So here we have a sherd. Again, notice it's properly labeled. Uh, this one happens to be a calcolithic sherd. Um, and what we want to know, by taking this curvature that's on the rim here, uh, using that to figure out what the diameter of the pot would be at, at the rim, what archaeologists would call at stance. And we also want to find out this, what percentage of an entire circle this particular arc of the rim makes. Now to do this we have to assume that pots are circular and we all recognize that they're not always circular so there's always a certain room for error uh, in this kind of measurement as with any kind of archaeological measurement. Now the way we do this is pretty simple. You want to line one edge, one of the broken uh, edges of the rim shirt uh, with what you might think of as the x-axis of the graph and you place that there and you rock the shirt back and forth until you get it at stance. What that means is you make it so that the entire surface, or as best you can, considering there's little chips and so on, uh, the entire surface of that lip of the pot is in contact with the paper. And then once we have it at stance, we then move it up and down along that y-axis until we find what we think is a good fit to the arcs that we see uh, drawn on the chart. Let me just get it at stance. Okay, there's at stance, and I think the best fit is right about there. So it's right about there. So uh, we can see two things here. One is that the circle that I've, or the arc that I've matched it up with, is the arc that is at 14, one, two, three, yeah, 14, no, sorry, 13 centimeters. So that means we would estimate the diameter of the pot that this came from to be 13 plus or minus one centimeter, uh, assuming that you know I could be out by as much as a centimeter here uh, pretty easily. And that's even assuming that it's circular and the re a more realistic error would be a bit larger than that considering that this could be slightly off circle. Um, and the, the, the per percent of circumference we get from this radiating line here which turns out to be 17 and a half percent. So we record that. This, this number is actually very important for a method of quantification uh, that I talk about elsewhere in my course uh, called uh, estimated vessel equivalence because that means this rim shirt constitutes 17.5% of a pot what we, uh, where we estimate the numbers of pots only by their rims. To measure the extent of retouch using one of these uh, radial graphs, we would first have to figure out how best to orient the flake or the tool on the, on the chart. Uh, in the case of uh, fully retouched tools, formal tools like projectile points, that's usually pretty straightforward because we would put the base, the, the base of the projectile point at the bottom and the point at the top, so the point would point towards zero. Uh, the middle of the base would be around 180, and then we just have to arrange it so that it's equidistant from the two top and bottom of the graph. So that gives us, um, this line would be the medial line of the artifact. Uh, with a big flake like this, it's not quite as easy to orient it, but you would have to, in most cases, if it's not a formal tool, use something like the axial length of the artifact 
to orient it. So we might look for uh, this one. Can we see a bulb of percussion? Not very well. This is not a very good flake to be doing this with. But uh, the best we could do is that the this was probably well. Maybe let's say it was removed from here. So let's say that was the that was the the point of percussion, and let's say the distal end is right about here. So we could orient it by those two points, like that, such that the reason to have these circles on it is to make sure we get it so that this line is halfway across the artifact. And then we look to see, let's say the retouch is here. We see that the beginning of the retouch is at about 100 and, let's see, it's, uh, about 145 degrees, and the end of it is around 100 degrees, right? So between 145 and 100, so that's 35 degrees of arc that have retouch on this particular artifact. Whereas this other one, again, we have to figure out how best to orient it. Not very easy on this one, it's hard to see what the axis is on it because the Ripples aren't terribly clear. Okay, I think it's from here. So let's say we orient it like that. And let's say the retouch goes from here to here. So it goes from 180 degrees to, let's say, 95 degrees. So the difference between those two degrees is 85 degrees, because 95 plus 85 uh, gives us the 180. So we would have 85 degrees of retouch on this one. So even though the distance of retouch on this one and the distance of retouch on this one are pretty similar, uh, this one is much greater in terms of the percentage or the percentage of the overall circumference of the tool uh, that has retouch. One piece of equipment that archaeologists frequently use is an electronic balance. This measures the mass of artifacts or anything else you might need to measure the mass of, like uh, charcoal or something like that. And they come in a variety of uh, rate, uh, mass ranges. Um, for small objects, you'll want something that maybe goes up to a couple of hundred grams. Uh, for very large things, you might need something that goes up to six kilograms. And they also vary in their precision. Some could be plus or minus one gram, some could be plus or minus a hundredth of a gram, and so on. But one of the things that's very important when you're using one of these electronic balances is that you make sure it's properly calibrated. Otherwise, you could be getting incorrect, incorrect data from it. Um, so here we have an example of an electronic balance here. And, I'm and the different makes of balances calibrate in somewhat different ways. But just to give you an idea of how it works, I'll show you with this particular one. So with this one, we leave the balance initially turned off. And when we turn the power button on, we hold it down for several seconds, and at some point, the display will say menu, and then when we take their finger off, it says cal, for calibration, then we press it one more time, and then it tells us the, the size of the, of the weight it wants us to put on it. So let's just say it's asking for a 300 gram weight, you would then place the 300 gram weight, weight on the, on the uh, pan of the balance, and then we press the, the on up button again, and then it does the calibration, and then if everything goes well, it reads out the mass of this particular weight, 300 grams in, this, in the case of this one here. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that I have a tissue placed on the pan here. Uh, you may be asking yourself, doesn't this give us in inaccurate results? In fact, it's fine to have uh, some kind of padding on the surface of your uh, balance as long as you've teared the balance, T-A-R-E, uh, teared the balance with the, the tissue in place because when it's zeroed, right now it's reading zero grams, it's ignoring that tissue in other words because it's taking the tissue into account. If we were to tear the balance without the tissue and then put the tissue on, that would not be good because the tissue weighs about one, almost one gram. Another kind of measurement that archaeologists make routinely is the measurement of color. Now most of you probably don't think of color as being a measurement, but in, in an essence it really is because what we're doing in the case of this particular device or chart, the Munsell Soil Color Book, is we're comparing the colors of artifacts and other things that archaeologists are interested in with standardized color chips 
that are recorded inside these, these books. And you're supposed to use these under particular lighting conditions. It should be natural but indirect light, ideally. And the way these Munsell books work is that each page um, has, has a different hue. In this case, this is the page for the 5R hue, which is a, red, a set of reddish colors. Um, and let's turn down a bit. Um, here we have the page for 7.5YR, which stands for yellow-red hues. This is a very commonly used uh, page for by archaeologists because a lot of soils and sediments have that color. Or the next one, which is 10YR, even more common among archaeologists that I know. Um, but because things like pottery and flint and sometimes other uh, materials that artifacts are made out of um, have very similar characteristics to sediment in many ways. They tend to have this, some of the same color ranges. So when we're trying to uh, estimate the colors of the surface areas on pottery or the cross sections of pottery, for example, we would quite often use some of these same pages. But in the case of pottery, for example, a lot of times they would be a little bit redder than your typical soil or sediment, in which case you might want to use the 2.5 YR or something like that. Now, one of the things I should mention um, when it comes to soil uh, charts is that, as I already mentioned, each page uh, consists of a different hue. And the two axes on here are two other variables. So we have three dimensions, really, with measuring color. One is hue, one is value along the y-axis here, and one is chroma along the x-axis. So we classify each of these color chips by its hue, value, and chroma, so that this brownish chip here, for example, uh, would represent 2.5 YR 5 slash, so that one I was going to, 3. So this one would be 5 slash 3, this one would be 5 slash 2. So you read that off the edges. Now when we are using this to uh, classify the color on the surfaces of pottery, for example, the way you do it, this is, and this is particularly important for soils and sediments, because you don't want to get these chips dirty because it would alter their character. So you're supposed to put the, the thing you're trying to measure underneath the page and kind of peek through those circles that are there to try to find which color chip matches the best. Now when it comes to pottery like this one, there's not a uniform color across it, so you have to keep that in mind. In this case we have what's called a slip on it, which is a darker red than the fabric. Where the slip is worn off, you can see the underlying fabric, which is kind of pink, and then the slip that was originally coating most of the exterior of this pot uh, is a kind of darker red. So you need to measure those things separately. So let's just look at for the slip for the moment. I'm not even sure this is the right page for it. Uh, probably not. It's probably none of these are particularly good matches. But let's see about the underlying one, which is lighter. We might have a decent match for the underlying color. Not so much. Close, but no cigar. Uh, still not quite right. No, in fact, that page doesn't seem to be quite working. So we turn. Let's try five YR. See if we get any better matches. Nope, that's not good either. Let's try one that's maybe an R one. Here's a ten R, which is quite a bit redder. Now here we're probably going to get a match for the slip. In fact, I would think that's not too bad a match. Um, this one here is probably a pretty good match for the slip. And again, slips can vary slightly in color, so you're not necessarily going to get a totally consistent color match. But I think that's pretty good. So that would be 10R54 for the slip. Let's see if we've got something for the fabric here. Uh, those aren't good matches. Nope. No, I don't think we're getting a good match for the underlying fabric. Let's see if we, see if we can find it on another page. How about 7.5 YR? or 75R rather. These are quite a bit pinker. Well, in fact, actually, that's probably a better match for the slip now that I think about it. Yeah, 
think so. So that would be 7.5R5 slash 6. Would be a pretty good match for the uh, slip. But for the underlying fabric, still not getting it. Maybe I should go the other way. How about 10YR? I don't think that's going to be it, but no, nah, definitely not. Nope. Let's try 5YR. Not quite red enough. No, we'll have to go back again to. Let's try 2.5YR. Okay, I think this is a little bit more hopeful. This one's not too bad. Should make it 2.5 YR7 slash 6. Now, some of you might be asking, you know, how precise and accurate can these things be? Well, the, in terms of, obviously not, no two people are going to likely to pick the exact same uh, color choice. So there's going to be a range of error as with any measurement in archaeology or in anything else for that matter. Um, but you can have uh, reasonable ranges of error. So for example, uh, if some other archaeologist besides me were to measure that, instead of getting this, they might get this one or this one, uh, but something kind of in that area there. So you can get kind of a plus or minus value on the hue, the, uh, the hue which would be different pages, because some other person might pick a different page than I do. And in essence, this is a three-dimensional um, paradigm, three-dimensional paradigmatic classification of colors, so that each page is the same as changing the row or column on a single page. So you have three dimensions. Um, so we might be off from two and a half. Well, we might have variation between two and a half YR and five YR if we got different people measuring the same shirts. And we might have some disagreement about the value or the chroma perhaps by one or two spots. So that gives us a, an idea of error on that. If you were to repeat the measurement several times by several different people, that would be an, a way of trying to estimate the reliability of the color measurements. The point is that even though this is not perfect, it still gives you much more reliable and precise measurements of color than the old-fashioned way of saying it looks like pinkish brown to me or something like that. Because pinkish brown can mean a lot of things to different people. And even though the Munsell people have quite nicely translated some of these colors into plain English like reddish brown or light reddish brown, the fact of the matter is that for most of us, when we say light reddish brown, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to all people. So Munsell chart is a very useful tool for archaeologists. We use them all the time. Uh, and th they're not particularly cheap, but there's also an alternative available nowadays, which is even more expensive, and that is an, a digital uh, Munsell color uh, reader. Um, which scan, with which you scan the thing that you're trying to measure the color on, and it actually calculates the Munsell color for you. Uh, those are becoming increasingly used, but they're still a bit pricey. Uh, whereas these, you can get them for you know, a little over $100. Um, and you can also buy individual pages, because most of the time, we don't need all of the pages that's in one of these books. Another tool that archaeologists use quite frequently in the lab is the binocular microscope, such as what you see here. This is a reflecting microscope. In other words, the light doesn't come from below, the way you would find in a biological uh, microscope, for example. Instead, it reflects off the surface of whatever it is you're examining, and then goes up through this, the opti optics of the microscope to the eyepieces up here. And um, we use this for a variety of things, including doing archaeobotany, looking at charred seeds and charcoal and that sort of thing. Also looking at very tiny uh, retouch and so on on lithics, and sometimes looking at soils and sediments to see what's in them, particularly looking for things like microdebitage and that sort of thing. Um, so it's very important to, to know how to use these properly. As I, as I mentioned in my health and safety video, you also have to be careful about eye strain if you're going to be using a microscope quite a lot. So I always recommend placing the microscope pretty close to a window, or at least in good natural light in a big room. The advantage of that is you can look up from the microscope from time to time and look out the window and change your focus so that your eyes don't get too strained. Now, how do we use these microscopes? Generally speaking, the ones that archaeologists use come with a separate light source. So this box over here uh, is the light source. And you need to know something about how to turn the light source on and off. 
most of them will have a switch as well as a dial. Before you turn it on, you need to make sure the dial is turned down to zero. Then you switch it on, and then you slowly increase the light level. The light, by the way, is directed through these fiber optic arms uh, onto the stage of the microscope. So there's two of them, and they're adjustable, so you can aim the light where you want it to go. So you gradually increase the light intensity until you get it where you want it. And then when you're finished doing your work and you want to turn it off, you don't just switch it off. You again, you slowly turn the light intensity down to zero, and then you turn it off. Now you may be asking, why do you have to do that? Uh, the reason is that if you turn these things on and off abruptly, you'll break the bulb, because the bulbs get extremely hot, and they're very sensitive to breakage when they go through very sudden temperature changes. So you don't want to just suddenly switch the thing on and at top intensity. It needs to be done uh, gradually. So um, turning it back on here. A lot of the time when we use the microscope, we're sorting very small items. So there are a number of other tools we would use to do that. Uh, this, I'm not going to actually do any real sorting here, but I just wanted to demonstrate some things. Uh, one thing that's handy to have is tweezers, because with tweezers you can very gently pick up something and move it somewhere, or you can just take a, put everything in a petri dish and use the petri dish to move uh, the material around until it's in your field of view when you're looking through the uh, eyepieces. Uh, and there's other kinds of tools you can use besides tweezers too. Some people like to use dental picks uh, or this, this kind of, uh, I guess it's a, some kind of dental pick that's kind of shaped like a hockey stick, very Canadian. Uh, this is actually a potter's tool, but it can be used also to, to push things around on the tray. So for example, if you're sorting stuff while you're counting them, uh, this is handy if you want to kind of push things aside that you've already counted so you don't accidentally count them twice. Even though the microscopes that archaeologists typically use in the lab are only in the range of, say, 40 power, you know, 20 to 40 or maybe 100 power microscopes, uh, we only use high power uh, magnification for specialized jobs like doing ceramic petrography or, or examining uh, cell structure in uh, charcoal samples. And we'll talk more about that another time. But a lot of the work that you do in the archaeological lab involves very low power magnification because sometimes you just want to examine a pot shirt or a lithic uh, to get, a, get an idea of what kind of retouches on the flake or look for some details on the, on the pottery that might reveal, um, get, provide some clues as to how the pot, pot was made or whether or not it has a slip on it, that sort of thing. Quite often you don't need to have very high power mag magnification in order to do that. So there's a number of tools that archaeologists use in the lab quite regularly. One is a hand lens like this one, and they're typically somewhere in the neighborhood of six power magnification. So that's pr fairly low. Um, so it's good for getting a, you know, getting a better idea of what things look like uh, without zooming in at really high magnification. Very useful tool, though, uh, that's in some ways better than this, um, but they, they have different advantages and disadvantages, is a jeweler's loop. So the, here we have a jeweler's loop. It folds together so it's, the lens is protected when you're not using it. In fact, they usually come with little pouches that you can keep it in when you're not uh, using it. But you open it up, and then you can hold it over the shirt and look closely. And this is higher magnification. Uh, this particular one is 10 power uh, magnification and you can see pretty small details on the shirt including looking at the broken section you can see get some uh, some idea of what the minerals in there might be not as well as you would with ceramic petrography using a be much better microscope and, uh, and having the pottery in thin section but uh, still it's a very useful a uh, very useful tool. Now this particular kind of uh, jeweler's loop also has an advantage of having lights on it. So it has an LED, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but the LED lights up the surface, makes it easier to see, because sometimes when you're, you're looking carefully at an object with a jeweler's loop or a, even a hand lens, uh, you can end up casting a shadow on the uh, artifact so it's hard to see. But this light that's built right into the lens or right, right around the lens, actually, you can see it here, um, makes it very easy to see details. In addition, this particular one not only has an LED, it also has ultraviolet light, um, which 
sometimes makes it easier to see certain kinds of minerals. Now we can also use that same uh, jeweler's loop to look at retouch on a lithic. And this is pretty good if you just want to get a general idea of what the retouch looks like. And you don't need really high magnification to do it. 10 power is more than enough for getting a general characterization of the retouch on the tool. I hope that video helped you better understand the kinds of measurements that archaeologists make in the laboratory, how they make them, what kinds of tools they use, what kinds of errors we might associate with those kinds of measurements, and what kinds of things we might use those measurements for. If you did enjoy the video, you might consider clicking the subscribe button down below, and that way you'll be updated when I publish other videos on archaeological laboratory methods on YouTube. You can also learn more about this topic by checking out chapter one of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, available on Springer. Thank you and stay safe.